verses uh, 22 to 24. Genesis 32 and verse 22. That night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. It was on the morning of uh, Tuesday, the 9th of August in 1983, that I watched uh, Douglas Macmillan come to the front of the pulpit in uh, Shiloh Calvinistic Methodist uh, Chapel here in Abba. He preached uh, a few years earlier, giving four memorable messages on Psalm 23. It had been a very stormy week. There had been boats that had sunk in the Atlantic at the time of the great race. Um, people forgot about the weather, and they came to the conference then. And really, that was the occasion when the Abba Conference was put on the map in uh, British evangelicalism. And 1983 was his return visit. Every seat was taken. I suppose that would be 900 people there. I have not seen it so full since Dr. Lloyd-Jones had preached there a few years earlier. There must have been a shepherd, and uh, that gave a unique dimension to his preaching on Psalm 23, and it's captured in the little published book, uh, which is a transcript of those four messages, and they've done me... Uh, pastoral pastoral work and help many Christians young and old but now Douglas had also been a uh, Highland wrestler in the Highland Games and when he announced then that he was going to speak on wrestling Jacob I wondered would there be some personal insights from the Highland Games that would colour his studies of this incident in the book of Genesis I sat back then with the others and Douglas came to the front and he said, The story of Jacob's wrestling at Peniel is familiar to every reader of the Bible. It's often been the subject of meditation for Christian believers. Preachers and commentators have applied it in widely different ways in the lives of God's children. It is always fresh and suggestive of new lessons in the spiritual life every time we come to it whether in our private reading of scripture or by instruction from the pulpit it presents to us some of the fundamental features of the work of God in the lives of men and women it would be correct to say that even the very young have heard it and read it many times and each time with renewed interest and the explanation of this is simple. This ancient story makes a direct appeal to the very deepest realities in the human life, and particularly to the profound workings of God's grace in the salvation of his people. That's how we started. I'll read it to you, because, of course, it's available in the transcript of those four um, messages entitled Wrestling with God. His Legacy. Those two books, Psalm 23 and uh, Genesis 32. I want to speak to you about two things tonight as we begin our, to examine this fascinating uh, section. Firstly, I want to speak to you about the solitude of this encounter. Memorable times uh, can come into our lives when we, like Jacob, are left alone. There's 24. We told in the previous verse how he took, escorted his wives across and the two maidservants, his concubines, the mothers of his children, he took them across and then his eleven sons. He got them all across on the ford the, uh, of the river Jabbok. And then he sent across all his possessions, verse 23, his goats, ewes, rams, camels, cows, bulls and donkeys in two or three herds that were shepherded by his servants. They went across too. All of them had disappeared into the darkness beyond the river Jabbok and they left him. Jacob was entirely alone. Finally, the sound of the noises of the animals bleating and mooing 
That disappeared into the night air and just night sounds. Crickets and a bit of a wind. Everything that was dear to him was on the other side of the river. And Jacob was by himself, without his possessions, without wives, without family, all. His life he had lived and worked in relationship to other people. He was Abram's grandson, the heir of the promised. He was his mother's favorite son. He wasn't his father's favorite, and he daily looked over his shoulder then dumbly at his favored older twin brother Esau. Jacob later became Rachel and Leah's husband and Laban's aggrieved son-in-law. Jacob had taken on board all these roles as he had grown up. And none of them was with him now. And the question then that he was facing was, Who are you? Who are you? Who are you in yourself, Jacob? Who are you? When you are left alone, before God, when there's no one around to impress or bounce your opinions off, when there is no one that you can measure yourself by, when everything's been taken from you, when all you've leaned on and worked for is gone and you are left alone, who are you? Who are you, Jacob? Until now Jacob was confident of his gifts and his own resources, of being able to always wheel and deal and get what he wanted. He outwitted his father, he outwitted his brother, he had triumphed in dealings with uh, Laban, his father-in-law. He was a strong man, he was a clever man, he was a self-sufficient man, he felt he'd got his act together. It had never been true. And now God is bringing that home to him as he brings Jacob back to the promised land to face up to the mess that he has created, the division in his family. He's lost his relationship with his darling mother who adored him. He would never see her again. And his only brother was his worst enemy. His determination to get the birthright had resulted in alienation from Esau and twenty years of exile. It had not been worth it to get the birthright. Now he cowers at the thought of meeting him the next day as Esau advances towards him with hundreds of armed men. So the Jacob who is here in the darkness all alone is being confronted with his sad past and his unknown future. And what he saw was not a pretty picture, a schemer, a deceiver, a physically very strong man and a neglecter of God. What had he done with his years so that now he's utterly alone? He had destroyed all that was best in his life. Even his marriage to his beloved Rachel by fathering children through three other women. He was faced with much unfinished business. Is it a picture of you? Can you stand solitude? Being left somewhere in total silence without a radio or a telephone or a TV, even a paper to read, just you there? Of course, and God, everything else stripped from you, all the spin, all the posture, all the posing, absent. Those rare times when you can face up to that solitude. Who are you? Is this life that you are living worthy of the person God intended a man like you to be? Are you doing in your life what men made in the image of God should do in their lives. Isn't this what it's all about? Isn't this why we're here tonight? 
Isn't there more for you than what you've done so far in your life? Most of you have got unfinished business, maybe a broken relationship that you thought time would heal. There's a promise you didn't keep. There's an unfinished job, an incomplete task. There's a lie that you hope would never catch up with you. Whatever it is, you know, sometime or other, you've got to deal with that. You've got to make the journey back to the place of betrayal, like Jacob was doing. You have to confront your past. You've got to face the people that you've hurt. You've got to come clean about your mistakes. You've got to own up, take responsibility for it, and bring it to a merciful God of love. You just can't go through life damaging people, left and right. You've got a conscience, you've got a memory, and there comes a time. And then another time. And then another time, if the long-suffering God sees fit, when he is determined to make you alone. And Jacob is learning about truth, and he's learning about reality, the hard way. He's out of the shadowlands and in the darkness with God. But life doesn't consist of relationships. It doesn't consist of the abundance of stuff that we collect. Man is what he is, alone before God. And nothing more than that. And nothing less than that. So God kicks away every prop holding up Jacob, and he's left alone with the memories of the past years and the uncertainty of tomorrow. And this is where we are introduced to Jacob, a man under the spotlight, who's come to an end of himself. There's no other strategies. There's no plan B. There's no plan B. He's run out of scheming. He's taking his final shot at appeasing his brother by very, very rich gifts to propitiate his brother's anger towards him. And now there's no one else around. Everyone is taken from him. Jacob's bag of tricks has been exhausted. No more disguises, no more animal skins covering his arms to deceive people. The voice is the voice of Jacob. The clothes are the clothes of Jacob. The body is the body of Jacob. The odor is the scent of Jacob. He's finally facing up to himself. Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son. He went off and wasted all the inheritance that he had. Blew it all. And then when he was feeding the pigs, he came to himself. Have you come to yourself? Jacob here is coming to himself. God slows us down. And God gives favorite sinners a time to think. Instead of being on the move, always having the monitor, always having the web, always having the earpieces and the music and the iPhone and the laptop and the road. There comes a place, there comes a time, maybe it's three o'clock in the morning, in the darkness, when all these diversions are silent. The walls that we've erected, such impressive walls to keep God out of our lives, are gone. This is the place where there's no one to speak to but God. Just left with ourselves, the whitewashed walls in their simplicity, in the darkness. And at last we're able to hear very faintly, but very certainly, the voice of one crying, in the wilderness. And then for the first time we give God our undivided attention. God makes Jacob divest himself of everything in order that Jacob is still and knows that the Lord is God. Jacob has got, God has got Jacob alone and at the end of his terror. 
I'm laboring this point because it's crucial and because it's one of the most difficult things in life to come to yourself and to be alone. It seems to me that everything in life seems to be conspiring together to make us strangers to solitude and to our own individuality and to our separate identity. Has there ever been a more powerful herd instinct than that which labours in the world today? People internationally are watching the same thing. They're laughing at the same jokes. They're hearing the same music. They're afraid to miss out on something that tomorrow in school or tomorrow in the office people will be so excited. To, Did you see it? Did you hear it? Banning God. Living without God. They must cling to fellow sinners. All they've got is people. And the first step in the direction of discovering truth and reality in the living God is to face up to your own individuality. So Jacob was left alone. Now God has many ways of bringing us to this point. And the one which we have before us is one of the most dramatic. He'd separated from his wives and his children and especially his goods and possessions his danger was that he identified himself with those things. And then God cut the cords that tied him to all of that. God brings that to pass. Sometimes he does it by an illness. The man is living his life with his family and he's surrounded by his children and he's very interested in his business and his profession and he lives for those things and he never says, Who am I? Have I a soul? What's going to happen to me in my life? He's lost and immersed in other concerns. And then one day he has a pain. And his arm hangs down limply and the pain goes down his arm. And he wobbles and he's breathless and he needs to go immediately to the doctor who sent him straight away in an ambulance to the hospital. God separates him from all those things. Perhaps he's arrested and he's on trial and he is found guilty and he goes to prison and that first day they put him in a cell and the door clangs shut behind him and for eight hours he is there in that cell. Perhaps then he's uh, lying in a hospital bed and he realizes I'm an individual. And I'm all alone. Hospital bed or sickness has been a means of a person having this experience. I'm simply illustrating the ways in which God brings it to pass. God can come into our lives and give us a great disappointment. He can rob us of our money. He can bring a crash into our business. There may be a friendship which was everything to us and that friendship comes to an end. There may be the tender realm of human affections. We thought it would be till death us do part. But he or she had other ideas. You read the lives of the saints and you will find that in such ways the world lost its meaning for them. And they looked to the sky above night and day and their conscience spoke to them. And they began this pilgrimage, this dealing with God. God has to isolate, God has to cut us off from the things for which we were losing our souls. It's my task as a preacher of Jesus Christ to speak to you as a gathering of individuals, quite personally, or speaking to you all of nobody particular in mind. I remind you, you were born alone, and that you will die alone. You don't leave this mortal coil in a gun, but one by one, we breathe our last, 
I was in a funeral on Wednesday and I looked at that wide coffin because uh, my my friend Keith was a strong man. I thought, well, how wide that box is. One box. And the four men, they let him down and down. And I thought, well, it won't be much longer before that will be me. We are individuals in the sight of God. We die as individuals. And as individuals we stand before the bar of God's judgment and we will be judged even for every idle word. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done. Whether it be good or bad. There will be no comfort to you in that day that you simply acted like all your peers, your chums, or the other men, or the other people in your family, that your morals were the same as theirs, that you believed what simply everyone believed, that your longings were for what everyone else was longing for, they, they won't be there. Away you will go. And they'll go away, and they'll have to answer for their lives too. Jesus says, all men are on a broad road, and they're all going along, beckoning and encouraging one another, but it's going to destruction. All you, like sheep, all of you, just gone astray. And the first mark of the gospel is to arouse us to personal interest and personal concern for what we are doing with our lives in the sight of God. To do personally with our Creator. God knows how to bring his Jacobs down. He always does. Those whom he is pleased to save, to whom he revealed his mercy and his grace, they have to be brought low in order to know their helplessness, their impotence. Don't they? The Pharisee in the temple thanking God that he's a great fellow and he's not like other people must be made like the publican. The Pharisee must hang his head and beat his breast and say, God be merciful to me, the sinner. God's visits to our lives need leave no room for for boasting and glorying in the flesh, Jacob was left alone with nothing in his hands. But, but that's where new life begins. You're alone in your birth. Mum looked at you, a red, scrawling baby, oh dear, and held you. And if she was a Christian mother, she thanked God and commended this baby to you, like Hannah did. Thank you, she said, I've received him from the Lord. <coughs> and I'm giving him to the Lord. And these are experiences that you can share with no one. They draw you into the sphere of individuality and they shut you in with God. You can be in a crowded church and God start to deal with you, convicting you of your sin and your need. And at such an hour you, you forget everyone else. You don't know how many or how few are in the congregation. How often over the years people who have been dealt with by the Holy Spirit have afterwards come and said to me, I felt you were talking just to me. I felt God had singled me out from the crowd. And that's why I came. But God was dealing specifically with me. Spirit can isolate you. Not in the darkness of your room, but where you are in a congregation like this. And speak to your mind and your conscience and your memory and your affections and then you need 
You need to go home tonight. And you need to deal with God. You need to kneel by your bed. You need to say words to God, and I'm not going to put them in your mouth. Your words about your life. And you need to tell God about how it is between you and him. Come out of shadowlands and come into the bright reality of this living God and deal with him. Second thing, the other thing I want you to see tonight is the figure in this encounter. Because you will notice that Jacob wasn't alone for long. God doesn't tantalize us. He keeps us waiting in a vacuum and that we're like this next week and, ne and next year and for the next decade. So we are told Jacob was left alone and the man wrestled with him till daybreak. So the figure who came up to him didn't walk up and introduce himself and sit on a rock nearby and begin to chat to him. He comes to fight him. Who is this person? Well, he's certainly a man. We are told, aren't we, in this text I read to you that he was a man. But we know from earlier episodes in the book of Genesis that messengers from God, angelic beings, may appear as men. They speak as men. They eat and drink as men and women eat and drink. They can push people out and they can pull other people into a house and they can close the door on a vain crowd, a mob that wants blood. They're totally indistinguishable, in other words, from regular human beings. So this wrestler who came to Jacob out of the darkness was a man, soon to be gasping and panting and sweating and grunting with effort as he wrestled with the patriarch. However, this man is identified by God himself in verse 28 as God. And Jacob also in verse 30 identifies the person whom, with whom he wrestled as God. I saw God face to face, he says, and yet my life was spared. And furthermore, in the book of Hosea, the prophet identifies the person as an angel that wrestled with Jacob. Hosea 12, 2 to 5. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb he grasped his brother's heel as a man. He struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. The Lord, God Almighty, the Lord is his name of renown. So Hosea, you see, is concluding that it is the angel of the Lord who wrestles with Jacob. And you know that this is the usual term in the book of Genesis to be used to represent a physical visible manifestation of God himself, what we call a theophany, and especially to represent an appearance of the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ in respect to his office as mediator. He is consumed with longing to come here to the world, to do his work of redemption. And so from time to time he assumes the form of a man and he tries it on for size. And he familiarizes himself with our limitations in a groaning world and he sees closer as a man. He sees the suffering and the pain and the guilt of men and women. He does it for some hours or for some days. He dwells among us in the old covenant. John Curridge suggests two reasons why this wrestling match appeared at night. Firstly, because the darkness clothed, cloaked the identity of the man with whom Jacob wrestled. It's likely he would have realized if it had been light, if uh, no clouds had gone across the face of the moon and the stars, he would have recognized, recognized the authority and power that this man had. And it was in the night, secondly, because uh, 
That's the time for self-examination, isn't it? In the heat of the day, there are things for us to do in the night. It's a place of solitude and meditation. And it is the time when fear grips a, a person. When one faces reality, one faces truth. So when the patriarch was utterly alone, the Lord came to Jacob, uninvited, unbidden, in the darkness the God of grace approached him. And the Lord, when he came, struck the pose of a wrestler. Did say anything? He just challenged the big fellow, Jacob. He engaged and grappled with the mighty patriarch in a match. Isn't that strange? Isn't that incredible? Of course, it would have been unsuitable for the Lord to do this with a boy, with a weakling, but with Jacob. Jacob could lift a huge rock off the cover of a well without needing any other men or crowbars to assist him. The third thing I want you to see here is the purpose of this encounter. Now what does it mean? Well, it means a number of things. Firstly, it means the Lord came to deal with Jacob where he was strongest. God does that. When he comes to us, he deals with the thing that we're most self-conscious of, most proud of maybe, most aware of in our lives when he came to the prophet Isaiah then where Isaiah was the strongest was his eloquence, his preaching, his poetry. And the Lord took a coal from the altar and touched his lips with that right coal. When he dealt with Peter, Peter was a man of enormous confidence and strength of character. And God dealt with him and crushed him through a teenage girl who said you belong to Jesus don't you and God dealt with the apostle Paul according to the gifts and privileges he had he'd been caught up to the third heaven he'd seen sights he'd heard words it wasn't lawful for him to repeat to anyone else what experiences he'd had and God then to temper those experiences brought us a counterpoise into his life, a thorn in the flesh, and inserted it in him so that he could only get by, not by the memory of past experiences, but by the daily grace that God gives. And so here was this Hulk, Jacob, and he had never met anyone as strong as himself. And here he is challenged in that area, in his might to a contest, to a trial of strength with another great man. Again, it means, secondly, this. It was a culturally suitable challenge. In the Near East, wrestling had great importance. Sumerian mythology describes a fierce wrestling match between Gilgamesh, the king of Erech, and Enkidu, and then, after the wrestling is over, Enkidu becomes Gilgamesh's friend. They fought. But it was not fisticuffs. It was a wrestling match for world dominance. Again, wrestling was one form of trial by combat. David engages with Goliath. It's to determine the outcome of a battle. So a wrestling match could serve as an ordeal to determine the issue of a trial. And then it's taken up in the New Testament, isn't it? And you meet it. You meet the image of an athlete, a runner, pressing to the line to win the prize, a, a man who wrestles against principalities and powers, and he wrestles against them. And so it is suitable culturally. Thirdly, Andreic activity was particularly prevalent at this time and place. Now there were times 
As I have told you, when demonic activity was more prevalent than others, especially when the Lord of Angels came and came to this world, and then you remember how um, throughout Jesus' ministry there are people that are just possessed with demons, and uh, there they are, and Jesus cast them out. They left the pit there, harassing him at every opportunity. There were, I am saying, certain seasons when there was angelic activity. No, it was not during the life of David, was it? Was there any occasion in the life of David, you tell me, uh, when there were angels present? And during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, I don't think there were angels present then at all. But here, during the time of the patriarchs, the time of Abram in particular, and here in Jacob's life. Remember that Jacob's company had been met, been greeted by a company of angels when they entered the promised land. That's how the chapter begins, you can see it back there in verse 1. The angels of God met him. So that uh, he's not to think, oh, it's my company now and I'm coming into my land. But there are angels that are there. And they're watching, and they're waiting. You remember how God places seraphim to prevent man entering again into the Garden of Eden. But these angels step aside, and they let him in. You see, Jacob, it's not just your company. This is not just your land, it's God's holy land that he is entrusting to you and your descendants. And the place was called... Mahanaim, which means two companies. So God is saying to him, it isn't that you made up your mind, Jacob, to come here and take this route and meet with me and enter again this land. It's not human initiative. We live and move and have our being in God. God determined me to speak on this theme tonight and you to be here to hear it. It's the plan of heaven. The Lord works all things after the counsel of his own will. And so he enters that land that he is preparing for his people. It's a holy land. And it's not surprising that there is a guardian band of angels there. And his heart must have beat twice and fast and furiously when he saw them as ours would. But now Jacob isn't encountering a band of angels but the angel of the Lord the appearing of God's own presence. You remember how that appears later on? How Moses then is on a similar mission and uh, how the angel of the Lord appears before him and he's angry with him because he has failed to obey God. He hasn't circumcised his sons and the messenger of God stands before him in wrath. You remember again Joshua faced with this great city of Jericho and will Israel enter the land and possess it and there is this great walled city before him and he is fearful. The captain of the Lord's host in his armor stands there before him advancing on him with a drawn sword and so it is this Lord then he comes out of the darkness to solitary Jacob to show to Jacob that the one he must dread the one you must dread is not your worst enemy here in the world it's not Esau but God himself who's advancing on you and threatening you, the messenger of the covenant, the Lord. Jacob's struggle finally is not with his twin brother. Remember how he had wrestled with him. Remember how when he was in the womb he grabbed his heel as Esau was to leave the birth channel and come into the world and he wanted to put him back he long there in the womb that he would be the firstborn. Jacob's struggle was with the Lord himself, the God of Abram and Jacob and Isaac. 
You are struggles not with me. With my preaching. Your struggle is not with your friends in the Christian Union. With the men and women in this congregation who tell you what you've got to believe and how you've got to repent and how you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That message isn't mine, it's not ours. Men did not invent it. It's God's message. It's his message to you. Hear him. You know, the God of much popular religion is not anything like the God of the Bible. The God of popular re religion resembles more the genie of Aladdin's lamp who pops up at our bidding just to carry out our desires, rub the lamp and he'll come and he'll do what you wish, name it and claim it, what lies. If we have no fear of God, we don't know the Holy One who comes to challenge us. Our Lord God is a consuming fire. So the Lord met uh, Jacob that night, a fearful adversary he met him. Fourthly, this act of two men exerting themselves, wrestling to either defeat or victory, was the perfect method for Jacob, for it be gouged into him, driven into his consciousness, made aware of it like nothing at all, but he was a weak man. True religion is more than notion, and God chose this way of making known his power to Jacob. Incarnate omnipotence condescended to grasp a mere man and steadily to overwhelm him. Notice now the significance of what we're told. Not that Jacob wrestled with a man. Not that Jacob challenged the man. Come on, man. Come on. There was nothing like that at all. A man wrestled with him. It would be amazing if uh, you ever managed to play football on a team that was competing with a team, one of whose stars was David Beckham. It would be even more amazing if Beckham chose to play football against a certain team because he knew that you were playing on that side. I must play against that man from Aberystwyth. What an honour that he thought that you were a challenge to him, that he wanted to take you on. Here is the Lord, and oh, how near he has come. He's been born in a stable, this Lord. He's lived in a home with half-brothers and sisters in Nazareth and helped his father make doors and gates and, and posts and cupboards. And he's lived for thirty years among them, this one. And you thought that you presented a challenge to him. He comes so close to cling to you. He comes so close as when two or three gather together in his name. He's there, sits alongside us in the pew, opens our understanding, illuminates our minds, instructs us, convicts us, rebukes us challenges us about what we are hearing, helps us to understand what we are hearing. Jacob wasn't wrestling with this man to obtain a blessing. The man was wrestling with Jacob to give him a blessing. It's the object of a wrestler to bring his opponent down, to pin him to the ground, to render him helpless. And that was the object of our Lord here. He wrestled with Jacob to pin him down, to conquer his spirit, to subdue his flesh, to render him helpless. The Lord wrestled with Jacob to reduce him to reality, to a sense of his own nothingness, to make him see what a poor, wretched, miserable, worthless creature he was. And God's purpose in all his dealings with us is that to make us strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, strong in grace, and to make us know and recognize and acknowledge to him our great weakness. When I am weak, then 
Am I strong? Now Jacob began to learn that he couldn't possibly prevail against this man. But in sustaining Jacob to go on wrestling with him, the Lord showed Jacob how much he was really for Jacob. I suppose he could have in a flash of a second crushed him to a, a lump, a bloody lump, and destroy him. Calvin comments on this passage in words something like this, we never fight against the Lord except by his own power and with his own weapons, that's what Calvin says. For the Lord having challenged us to this contest, at the same time he provides us with strength and the means to go on with the fight so that he both fights against us and fights for us. When he assails us with one hand, he defends us with the other. In fact, he supplies us with more strength to resist him than he employs in opposing us. So we can truly say, the Lord fights against me with his right hand and for me with his left hand. And yet God is absolutely one in all he does. He strikes us with a rod. He brings a powerful trial into our lives. And yet the Lord is our strength. And we become stronger by the very power through which he opposes us. That's what, that's what Calvin says. What a preacher. What insights. Fifthly, wrestling is so appropriate to divine choice because it involves the whole of a man's body and mind for a long time. It's not like uh, being challenged to a hundred meter dash. It's a marathon. It is searching. There can be only one winner that night. This man wrestled with Jacob Till daybreak, verse 24, on and on the men wrestled, gripping and striking and twisting and pulling, pulling the other to the ground, rolling around in the dust, always aiming for some advantage, looking to pin the other one down on the soil. It was grueling, didn't talk to each other. Jacob is battling for his life. Hours pass, neither man is able to gain the advantage. Jacob is exhausted, he cannot stop, he cannot show any sign of weakness, what time is it, one o'clock passes, and two o'clock passes, three o'clock passes, four o'clock, the sun rises isn't far away, they wrestle on desperately together, it has to be long, it has to be thorough, it has to be life shattering, and life changing, unforgettable because there were immense issues, that Jacob had to face with his life, which had to be resolved permanently. This couldn't be some brief encounter. The encounter in the dark and the strife that followed was not the result of some last minute decision that God made. He determined from all eternity that he would deal with Jacob in this way, on this occasion. There were great issues. You understand what the issues were. Jacob was the only Jehovahist in all the world at this time. There is no hint that any of his eleven sons or his two wives or his maid servants knew the Lord. Would they have come to fear Jacob from how they had watched Jacob behave in the past twenty years? Jacob had to change. He had to change. And we made a new man. That the heirs of the promise might new know the, their great benefactor and protector. Indeed and in truth. There had to be a rearranging of priorities. It's not enough that he was a wonderful sheep herdsman. That he could breed. And that he was a physically strong man. It's not enough. Jacob you've got to seek first. Jacob, you've got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness that has to be first in your life and in the lives of us all. He had bow to the will of God in, in all he did. He had to acknowledge God was wiser than him. 
God was stronger than him, more powerful than him. Jacob had to lose his life for the Messiah. And he who loses his life finds it. He to surrender to the Lord in all things from his heart. He to do it willingly. It is as the Lord of glory wrestled with Jacob that he revealed to him what grace, what mighty grace. Jacob had been playing with God for years. He was religious. He had had some experiences of God in the past. The hound of heaven didn't give up dogging his path through the years and now the mighty one he comes very close and he grips him and he holds him tight and he won't let him go and he purges his will and he rearranges his prejudices and he redirects all the energies of his life in a new way that he desires God Jacob thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength God wanted all of Jacob like he wants all of you and the patriarch had done so many things his own way he'd made colossal mistakes he'd adopted devious means to achieve his own ends and God now says enough and he purges his will and he cleanses it and redirects it but now he will live for the glory of God come now Jacob come now Jacob with man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and so God brought Jacob to the end of himself he needed to understand that the battle that was going on was not strife between himself and Esau but between himself and God that God was not coming alongside him to bless the gifts that he had sent to Esau to make him propitious to his brother would God take a human form the end of which was to help Jacob out of a fix and reconcile two brothers don't wait for God to come to you before you do what's right tonight so you call your brother and you apologize to him and you arrange to meet him as soon as possible you don't need an incarnation of God for you to do correct moral ethical actions this was different uh, the true battle was between Jacob and the living God Esau was a sideshow Esau was an occasion Esau was a circumstance Esau was an excuse the real battle was for Jacob's soul and the real cause was for the glory of God in this man's life but henceforth he lived for God and loved God and gave himself to God and made his body a living sacrifice to God you see it in all the trials of our lives every one of us every one of us will we trust God will we obey God is God going to be glorified in our lives it was thus with the story of Job was it not God's integrity impugned by Satan you remember how Satan came challenging God look, look at your people how they limp and stagger and they fall look at them they're sinners all you people have you seen my servant Job God said ah yes I have but does he serve you for nothing he's serving you because of wealth and health and power and prosperity that he enjoys Satan impugns the integrity of God the only reason that Job or any Christian loved God as they profess was because we had good things from God. So Job, quite unaware, is drawn into a conflict. It's a conflict which results in the destruction of his wealth. It's a conflict which results in the destruction of his health. It's a conflict which results in the destruction 
of his father. It wasn't a battle between Job and Satan, or Job and other human beings, or Job and natural disasters. It was a battle for the integrity of God. Job's trials were a, a sideshow in the great battle. I'm saying it's the same thing here in the story of Jacob. The issue in the Bible is the trust and faith and holiness of a man who says, For to me to live is Christ. God has to bring Jacob to a point where he realizes that it doesn't matter what happens the next day. If his life is going to end the next day, if Esau sends the men in with their swords against him and chops him into the pieces, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how long you live or die. The most important thing is that Jacob changes from being a merely ordinary guy. And that he submits to God. That he serves God. That he knows God. That he loves God. That he does God's will. That's the only lesson that Jacob has to learn and never, never, never forget. And it's the lesson then that we need to learn. It's the clearest point I can make from this pulpit. When you're in the valley, when you're in the crucible, it's very difficult. When life and death issues are before us, and here we are, we're trying to justify, aren't we? How are we trying to justify how we've been? And it's not been as, as bad as God is saying it has been. And many of the things we've done are rotten. And our greatest need is for God's mercy. And for cleansing and washing. And he has power to change us. So that henceforth we live, we live for him alone. Now is the time to submit to the God of Jacob. And fulfill your chief end. And your chief end is to glorify Almighty God and enjoy Him forever. Amen. Lord, bless your word now to us. Come and meet with us. Don't let us go through life just bumping into people and being left to our own devices and schemes and being satisfied with the second best. Deliver us from shadow lands, we pray. Bring us into the holy, healing light of thy presence, that we may live with thee and for thee all our days, that thy name may be honoured in us, in the world, and then enjoyed by us forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.